So uh, good evening, everyone, or a good morning if you are somewhere else in the world. Um, and thank you, Benjamin, for leaning so nicely to, uh, to my talk. So um, whereas Benjamin talked about how to make really accurate um, 3D pose estimation using many cameras, um, he briefly also hinted on that there is um, an easier way using a, a novel method called lifting, and this will be the topic of my talk. Um, but before, I'd like to um, thank a very interdisciplinary group uh, of the RAMDL lab and my funders for support. Um, so very briefly in the RAMDL lab, we are interested in studying behavior from um, neuromechanical principles. So our favorite experiment is to pick a command neuron, which is a neuron that creates behaviors, um, then study it, um, study uh, the behavior generated by, um, um, by um, making that command neuron generate the behavior using statistical methods. And then we, if you're really interested, we can look at the neuromechanical principles using calcium imaging. Um, one thing that I hopefully don't need too much convincing of is that pose estimation is really key to understanding the neural con control principles. So one key aspect to it though, is that there is a trade-off. So um, although pose estimation has gone a long way from the beginning, so it probably started by, uh, by Bernstein, who um, essentially took intermittent photographs um, to study um, essentially the atomic composition of behavior. We've gone a long way from that. So novel methods using uh, 2D markerless pose est estimation methods can have a really, um, give a really, really accurate uh, quantification of behavior and is really widely used. However, 2D poses suffer inherently from um, a loss of information. So um, you can have multiple post configurations in 3D that will still lead to the same 2D projection. And therefore a second big leap would be going to 3D. And there are many different methods. One of them of course is uh, what, what has just been presented. Um, however, there is a challenge here, which is that many of the experimental systems look like that. There are heavy space constraints. And it's something that we face in the RAMD lab too. So one of my challenges was in my larger scale project to solve this. And essentially, um, I like to um, give you our contribution already. What we do is essentially take um, single camera um, images and we try to generate 3D positions. So on the top video, what we can do is to essentially consider a situation when some uh, poses will be occluded by, for example, the animal turning and not being visible in the camera, or perhaps you only have one view um, at all. And in that case, you still want 3D information to generate, for example, joint forces or, or for more advanced kinematic analysis. Um, let me give you a brief, brief background is essentially what the challenge is. So um, traditional methods rely on uh, typically some, what's something called is triangulation. Um, in triangulation, you essentially take a point in 3D space and those points through the focal points of the camera will create projections on your on your two cameras um, here too, or you can have more cameras as well to increase accuracy. And what you do during triangulation is to imagine that there is now a point estimate, which will project onto your uh, camera frames, and then you optimize for these projections so that they are as close to your um, observed um, points as possible. This is right now the state of the art in obtaining 3D. However, it's quite complicated because it needs multiple cameras. An alternative though is through um, lifting or if you, if you think of it as a glorified regression. Essentially what you do now is to rather than individually think of the points, you think of a collection of points. So lifting doesn't make sense with for only one point, you need a, a point arrangement or a pose as we say. In that case, you take um, the whole, all of the points in a two dimensional camera projection and then try to infer the three dimensional pose using this function F. This function F is typically um, approximated by a deep neural net with certain parameters to, to minimize again this um, projection error. Um, this is by, um, well, one, I have to say that you need one camera, of course, um, but also it's an ill post problem um, simply because, um, again, what I've said, there can be many different uh, um, three dimensional poses that lead the same projection. So this challenge has nevertheless been solved. So um, for human poses at least, um, or at least to a large extent. 
In human poses, they have a large number of poses. So um, there's a huge data set that contains in the order of millions of poses of people doing, you know, dancing, yoga, or whatever you like. Um, however, for animal pose estimation, there are particular challenges. So for example, we can have occluded key points, um, possibly no grand truth at all, and much less data. So um, these are the challenges that we like to address by taking a, a well-known network that is quite simple. It doesn't require us to use temporal information and we can modify its training and the data augmentation methods to actually cope with these challenges. So what we do is we take our simple setup. We take six cameras, we record our fly because we do flies in our lab. Um, and then suppose there's a case when we only have two cameras. So each camera is recording um, three limbs on one side of the fly. One thing what we can do then is to feed in both of these images on either side into our um, network. Um, the network will have no idea which side the, um, uh, the image is coming from, so it will learn both um, post configurations against um, three-dimensional ground truth data. We typically rotate this so that, as Benjamin said, um, it is advantageous so that if the network only learns the depth of the image as opposed to trying to predict all three coordinates. Um, and what we notice is that by um, choosing the behavior sufficiently diversely, we can get really remarkable accuracy. So um, if we trained on different behaviors, we notice that so the little um, golden dot shows you what behavior has been trained on. So MD and ADN are two optogenetically driven behaviors through command neurons. And the control behavior is just a spontaneous behavior when the fly can do whatever she wants. Um, so basically what we notice is that if we train only on uh, optogenetically driven behaviors, so the first two columns, then other behaviors are typically quite badly predicted. But if we train on spontaneous behaviors, which supposedly explore the kinematic space quite well, um, we actually get quite a good prediction for even optogenetically driven, stereo highly stereotypical behaviors too. Um, we also compared it to uh, triangulation and we noticed this that um, if we have uh, four cameras, we basically get the same accuracy by using only two by lifting. Um, and at least for the camera angles we tested, we get actually uh, quite a good uh, accuracy from each angle. However, there are much um, uh, more complex cases that one, is, one can consider in experiments. One is one that showed where you actually have occluded key points, especially now that the animal is turning. In this case, um, from the side view that um, gives you the triangulated ground truth, only one half of the points are visible at any given time. So if you want to now train um, this such a lifting network, you actually face a disaster um, simply because the other half of the points that are not shown in red, the network is free to predict since you, are, since you don't have ground truth for the unseen points. So what you observe when you're trying to train the network is that the network has very um, completely chaotic predictions. So what do we do to fix that? Um, we noticed that one thing that we can do is to uh, exploit the symmetry of animal movements. So the left flight or bilateral symmetry and this um, applies for um, both of these cases that you can see now. Um, so we take uh, again two viewing angles. So we have we like this prism system, which is very simple. Using only one camera, you get two angles. And we try to align the images so that the fly is the fly is aligned with respect to the same reference frame. Um, in this case, um, th through training, we feed the network with either the left or the right hand side. However, all of these have been aligned against the same reference frame. So this way. The network um, is quite remarkably able to essentially delay triangulation towards a training stage, effectively filling in information that you are not given it. So you get a 3D information. So when you're actually trying to predict, you see that it can give a very good accuracy for um, unseen points. And moreover, for experiments that have occasionally um, um, have corrupted points, our network can actually, from the trends of the data, um, predict um, those points correctly that have been um, mislabeled essentially. So um, these, these are shown by these little um, um, white triangles. Those, those are points which, for which the input was good. So the, the ventral view, which we are lifting is, is good. 
but the side view has been incorrect and the network corrects it. And this is the uh, result, essentially triangulation and uh, lifting gives you similar results. However, what happens when you have uh, simply no um, 3D information whatsoever? This is quite frequently encountered, um, especially in simple systems where you require high throughput. And this is very um, commonly um, employed in Drosophila, but other systems as well. Here is one example where you essentially study social behavior of flies with one camera from the bottom. Um, crucially, you cannot study physical degrees of freedom here. So you have a projection and you're observing changes in length uh, from this projected view. So what you would like is to, re to recover joint angles, for example. Um, one thing that we notice is that we can transfer the network that we had previously obtained from, from a same angle and study this problem except that there is a domain adaptation step that's needed. So if you have different resolutions, you can imagine that if you have now a lower resolution system where you have multiple flies, hence you share resolution. In that case, um, the input can, um, the high resolution input can essentially be varied uh, to many different pixels and still be indistinguishable from the point of view of your test data set. So therefore, in training, one has to account for that by essentially adding a noise in proportion to the um, resolution difference of data sets. And therefore, you can generate now data that has been previously unseen. And this is what I show you here. Um, these are two data sets that um, one was taken from a previous study, and the other one um, is from what we, we collected. And the um, essentially the red dots show, the red boxes show. Uh, information that has previously not been seen um, at all in these experiments. Um, and what you also see is that in a projected view, so if, if you look at the ZX projection, um, those are actually um, um, progressively smaller circles that also people see in experiments um, in terms of lag amplitude motion. So um, to sum up, we have um, created um, a framework that can really make um, 3D pose estimation simple from one camera. Um, it can um, use um, corrupted uh, data and also occluded points and is able to essentially um, perform domain transfer where you get 3D information for free using one of our uh, train networks. So I invite you to look at our um, GitHub page for the code because it's already been uh, on BioArchive for a few days now. Um, and welcome your questions now. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, so unfortunately, due to these technical issues we have